the food. Well, buckle up. Back in the old time machine. 13th century. Texture, taste. Very fishy. Preserve retives. Cornish pastiche. Oh, my God. I've never even thought of that. The themes of empire, mission, inheritance, and destiny. Hello and welcome back to What the Food, the podcast that uncovers the fascinating origins of dishes, food items and drinks from all around the world. We dive headfirst into history to try and figure out why we eat the food we eat. My name is Miles Dickinson. As always, I'm here with my best friends, Andy Cantor and Dom Gray. And today we're uncovering the origins of a compressed blocky meat substance. Ooh. Yeah. Gelatinous, salty and somewhat mysterious. It's spam. It's spam. Spiced ham. Mm, is that maybe is what it stands for? It's a theory, but it's not right. But it's a theory. Okay. It's Do you see spicy. what I did there? It's not, yeah, uh, it's not, not spicy, spicy at all. But, no, but you can have things that are spiced and it isn't spicy. Name Spiced two. rum. Spiced rum. And, yeah, but it's um, got spices in it. Yeah. Spam could have spices in it. It doesn't like burn your mouth, does it? Spicy doesn't have to mean <laughs> Name hot, one more. mate. Uh, mulled <laughs> wine. <laughs> you could say, oh, it's spiced. Spiced mulled wine. Nah, your argument's in the bin, mate. Uh, yeah, both of them were <laughs> drinks, and I'm talking about <laughs> spicy meat here. Yeah, but still, look, <laughs> spiced ham. Yeah, it's not spicy. Um, okay. No, no, no. It's a pinky. But it is delicious. Ooh, big fan of you. <laughs> Bit of a I fritter, boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've not had spam for a long time, no. but yeah, it is a guilty pleasure of mine, mm. very occasionally. Okay, no, I, I like it. I fuck with it. I actually looked in the supermarket. For it yesterday. How much do you think a tin of spam costs in uh, Sainsbury's? To £1.94. £1.94? <laughs> See, no, because I think it's one of these weird foods that's been affected by the Costa Lizzie crisis. Costa it's dead. one of the weird ones. Costa Lizzie crisis. What She's the fuck is that? Dead, Costa- mate. Come on. Nah, come on. Um, come on. We're almost 30, you fucking idiot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Grow old. You're almost 30. Yeah. Don't be saying that. I think it's weirdly one of the foods that's been affected quite a lot by it. You're right. Weirdly. I don't know how I know this. No, you're correct. Because um, you've been on a little spam I've seen, <laughs> Yeah, because yeah, I've been like, oh, I'm going to go get some Spanish It's really cheap. What the yeah. hell? <laughs> you know, like, um, you see like day traders have got like the whole spreadsheets on, like live on the desktop. Miles has got mm. like the price of spam tracking it like every, every day. <laughs> yeah. All my stocks and shares. Yeah. It's having a bull run right now. Spam. It's coming up. Cashing in more Buy tins. Buy the dip. More Buy the tins. dip. <laughs> what is your actual guess at it though, Miles? Because you've said um, you think it's expensive. All right. How expensive all right, yeah. is it? Uh, I'm thinking £3.50. You, you're pretty much bang on. It's 3 25 <laughs> <laughs> Don't say anything. <laughs> It was a no. guess. <laughs> oh, good. yeah. A bit of market research that you've been doing. <laughs> 325, yeah. Because you think like, you know, a convenient tinned product is in your mind a cheap mm. thing to buy. It's not in this case. It's not. Well, it should be, shouldn't it as well? Because it's pretty processed, isn't it? Right? It's very processed. Yeah. I think it is. Like, it's a bit like Marmite as well. Like you either super love it or you mm. just loathe it, right? There's there's kind of no middle ground, I don't feel. Yeah. But it is one of those things where it's grotesque to look at and the mm. concept and idea of it is grotesque. But then as soon as you try it, that's it. You love it. I yeah. think that's what always put me off of it. Growing up, mm. just I just find it very weird that it's just a block of meat. Mm. Like I'm by no means like a vegan or anything, but even that's a bit much for me. You know, in the supermarket, it's sat on a regular shelf. Mm. It's not being fridged. Now that is something that freshness. I've never even considered. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Our resident spam expert opening it's up the It's a floor. room temperature meat product. <laughs> it is. It yeah, is. that's off-putting to be fair, isn't it? I think before we judge it, Let's dive nose first into its porky essence. A taste that's as unique as its name. Texture that can only be described as curiously soft, yet firm. Ooh. And a smell that is like, it's just unmistakably spammy. There's no other smell like it, I don't feel. So in terms of the taste, salty, I'd say. Very. I meaty. That's probably how they keep it at room temperature, isn't it? Yeah, preservatives, you're probably right. Uh, meaty. Definitely, because it's a block of meat. It's going to be meaty. And a certain, like, I don't know, stance of like, don't really know what I am, but I am what I am. Quite powerful, mm. I think. Spam, just in, in as an essence. Quite a... Yeah, sit, it sits in a grey area of food, mm. doesn't it? Yeah. An in-between zone. A purgatory of meat. Hmm. <laughs> Purgatory of meat. It's a meaty purgatory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. The taste, it's like, um, I don't know, it's hard to put your finger on the taste of spam. It, it, it's just like, as if you just got loads of sliced wafer thin ham and just like scrunched it all into like a ball. Mm, really, yeah. Started eating it. Garbage it disposal where they like really kind of crump into some little squares, yeah. cubes. Exactly. And instead of going in landfill, it goes in your mouth. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it's one of those, the more you think about it, the weirder it kind of gets. Yeah. Mm. I'm surprised it's lasted this long. Just like... Yeah, well, it's, it's a good product. It fills a market need. We'll come to that in a minute and we'll come to how it kind of became so successful. A lot of it was due to the time that it was created and what mm-hmm. was going on in the world. Mm-hmm. But it does feel fill a, uh, a a gap in the market and it was a super kind of revolutionary product when it came out. It was nothing like spam. But before we dive into this, really, texture. Texture of spam. Topic of great debate, I'd say. It's like jelly, meat. It's got like the firmness that you'd find maybe in like a normal bit of meat, like a bit of steak maybe. But then yeah. there's like a like a, a tender wobble that kind a of tender is, wobble, <laughs> like a tender wobble that like you'd get out and like a pate, like a brick of pate. Okay, yeah, it's like firm on the outside. Yeah, if you pressed it with a finger hard enough, your finger would go in. Would it? Yeah. <laughs> if you tried that. <laughs> but you know, because of the high fat content, when you slice that bad boy and put it in a frying pan and fry it, mm. it has that caramelization that starts to occur. You end up then with a crust that forms, a meaty caramelized crust. So it's um transforms itself once once heated, some would say. Some would say. Yeah. The uh the aroma of spam. It's interesting been a long time since i had a can of spam but i remember a time opening it and it's not unpleasant it's like a taste the difference dog food you kind of open it and you think that don't smell too bad you know <laughs> I, can't, I can't say that i've ever had that experience <laughs> my life yeah. mad dogs eating tonight <laughs> but you, you know <laughs> when you know you're kind of tempted you know it's good shit for the dog it's like that <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's intriguing kind of mild mildly Attractive, the smell, I'd say maybe. Something to it that, that doesn't put you off straight away. In conclusion though, Spam's taste, texture and smell. It's a trio of like sensory curiosities that blend together to form an enigma, a gastronomic enigma. And I think I think the whole point around it's either, it's like Marmite, you either love it or you hate it. It's quite a, quite a good way to, to summarise it. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. I think, believe it or not, Spam is actually one of the unsung heroes of the business world. Since its debut by Hormel Foods Corporation back in... In 1937, the canned pork has waltzed its way into 44 countries and sold a whopping 8 billion cans. It's a lot. Well, it's a big number. That is a lot. It is a lot. But what's the secret sauce to spam success, you say? Well, someone who spent a fair time pondering consumer habits when it comes to meat consumption. I'm going to let you know. I'm going to let you know now. I've oh, delved into the, really? the, the, the deep, dark depths of how humans consume tinned meat. And yeah, Spam wasn't just another product at all. It filled a genuine gap in the market. When Spam first hit shelves in 1937, it was the only canned meat in town that didn't need a fridge to stay fresh. There you go, Milo. You did. You, you were onto that before he even told us. Exactly. Into war years so, as well, getting ready for taking some meat where there might not be fridges. I mean, I yeah, don't, don't think true. that they knew that it was coming. I'm not saying that the creators of Spam started the World Wars. Or- no. At the time, 1937, most people didn't actually have fridges in the kitchen either. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So, game changer. Just like a people. pantry. Yeah, exactly. Just like a pantry or a hole in the ground. First meat that didn't need to be refrigerated. So what is it about Spam that means it doesn't need to be refrigerated? Is it what we said before? Is it that kind of high salt content, high fat content? Airtight. So we'll come to the original recipe. Yeah. But yeah, I think it managed to carve out a special place in the hearts of Americans by embodying like the spirit of kind of ingenuity and resourcefulness that was so kind of admired in America kind of during that, that period. The original Spam recipe, super simple. Pork shoulder, ham, pinch of salt, dash of water, a sprinkle of sugar and sodium nitrate to keep things fresh. So it's that sodium nitrate that is wow. the preservative that is that means it doesn't have to be refrigerated. Sodium nitrate. Mm. Wow. Okay. Doesn't sound great to be putting in your body, does it? Uh, no, we know, worse, you know in the modern day that sodium's not great for you in high amounts mm. and nitrate. You know, you're not having bowls of nitrate, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a weird part. <laughs> no, I suppose you're not, Miles. You're right. You're right. You're not at all. Yeah, I think it is, it's used generally as a food preservative. I think it still is to this day. There's obviously been like various kind of clamp downs on various forms of um, sodium nitrate, but that is, that is or the- Or like the amount that you can put in Yeah, exactly. Kind of yeah, that passes. It was probably different for different countries as well. Or different countries right. are different uh, levels that you can add in. Well, America are like, put it all in, 100% <laughs> sodium nitrate. We don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Sodium for dinner tonight, kids. <laughs> Bowl of nitrate for breakfast. You complaining? It's the fucking war, man. Sodium nitrate. 
Have it in fucking bucket full. <laughs> They're on the front lines. We're back here. We just eat sodium nitrate. Just fucking s- spoons of sodium nitrate. Just to keep them preserved. <laughs> yeah. If we eat the preservatives, we will stay alive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm bulletproof. I have my sodium nitrate. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Two percent port, ninety-eight nitrate. <laughs> but yeah, Americans. Food, Americans. Uh, food hygiene laws are just uh, something else over there, aren't they? Not great. They're not great. But no, I think in the grand scheme of things, that recipe could be worse, right? Pork shoulder, ham, pinch of salt, dash mm. of water, sprinkle of sugar, and sodium nitrate. Yeah, like, I was going to ask about the cut of the meat because um, you know you'd think that they might try and get away with a few little snouts and eyelids and stuff, trotters, and trotters. If mm. they're just going to well, m- mash it up and make it in a can anyway, you know. I think the main ingredient or the main bit of meat is pork shoulder ham is a bit a bit of a grey area <laughs> dubious <Yeah. laughs> ham guys yeah. ham ham <laughs> it's ham <laughs> which bit of the ham just, just the ham <laughs> ham you know ham <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah they've been very clever there haven't they with yeah. the use of ham yeah exactly <laughs> who knows what it is pork shoulder known for its you know kind of fattiness mm. it's a piece of the pork that you use for like pulled pork it's fatty it's throw a few eyelids in there oh, yeah good mix um but that recipe stayed that way until all the way until 2009 when hormel decided to give the old recipe a tweak by adding potato starch um why <laughs> why why? <laughs> why you might wonder well miles i can tell yeah. you exactly why the infamous gelatin layer that you used to get in a tin of spam mm-hmm. best bit what they got rid of it <laughs> best bit <laughs> What? It's not there. If you, this, you've obviously not had a tin of spam since 2009 because from 2009 onwards, they added potato starch, which banished the infamous gelatin layer. So you don't get that wobbly bit that greets you when you pop a can open anymore. It's gone. Oh, You're looking God, like a brave was... man, mate. Yeah. <laughs> you, you've got a bit should pale. We, should we end the pod here, mate? <laughs> Just get it finished. <laughs> yeah. I need out. But then it's that, it's that jelly bit on the outside that is what helped you get it out of the can. you the... <laughs> comes out the can. <laughs> you, how's you again with those moves? How do you normally... audio <laughs> experience. <laughs> that was a double popper, that one. Um, yeah, I buy Spam Duos. <laughs> <laughs> like a Snickers Duo, but... <laughs> yeah. Two, two two tins molded together <laughs> comes in two handy fingers so you don't have to eat the whole can um, <laughs> welded together I'm just imagining like two cans yeah. stuck together but I thought that's what gave it the lubrication to get out of the can because you know that for me is like a little mini game you know <laughs> like, I can tell it means a lot to you by yeah, how yeah. good you were at reenacting it <laughs> but yeah you have to work for your spam you, doesn't, yeah. you know you don't just crack it open and it falls out because it's covered in you know it's got potato starch in it it had a bit of a bit of a game yeah. to it wait a bit of jelly's gone now so you're not going to get that anymore they've tweaked it they've tweaked it they tweaked it when they released the can back in um, like I said 1937 um, they were eager to drum up some excitement for their new canned concoction okay so at this point it's not called spam okay it's not got a name it's called um, mysterious spam Meat product A. Just made that up, but they've called okay. me some of that. So to, yep. to drum up some excitement, they decided to throw a naming contest. That's how you end up with like Boaty McBoatface exactly. and stuff like that. Exactly. Yeah, but it was right. a different time. It was a different time. Yeah, people, yeah, people, people actually... Way more respect. Didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah exactly. Way yeah. more respect. The country's gone to the dogs. Naming a boat, Boaty McBoatface. <laughs> Fucking hell. <you know. laughs> <laughs> so they uh, they put the, the feelers out there. Um, a load of people entered the competition and um, one bloke won, a guy called Kenneth Danu. Um, he was an actor with a flair for catchy names, apparently. And would you believe it? He was the brother of the vice president of Hormel. That sounds a bit mm-hmm. uh, bit silly. Mm-hmm. Bit of a quinky dink. Was there a cash prize for this? Uh, yeah, $100. Mm. I mean, back then, that's probably what? Thousand? Cos- like Cosy living, mate. Inflation. Cosy living, yeah. But yeah, so he won. Okay. And he won a $100 prize. And he came up with the name Spam, which turned out to be a stroke of branding brilliance. Is it a, uh, was it just as a word or is it like a, what they called an acronym? So there's a couple of tales. Jay Hormel, the big boss from um, 1929 to 1954, once let slip that Spam um, is a blend of spice and ham. Spiced ham. I said you spiced that. Ham. You did. You say. guys, you guys were nasty. We agreed to you. Mm. Just trying to gaslight mm. him. Spiced ham. Spam. Yeah. You see, um, I was see, there. I, I was there. 
I always thought it was specially prepared American meat. So that is another tale that people have kind of spun by themselves. So he, he never confirmed that that whole okay. blend of spice and ham. He just let it slip once in a, I think it must have been some sort of, some sort of fucking press conference well, he was giving about meat. <laughs> we're going to play a 4 4 two. We're going to put a spam up shop, spam in the go. We yeah. might have a double pivot in the midfield with two spams. A little spam duo. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, people people have put their own spin on it as well. So some people are saying that spam stands for specially processed American meat. It should be super okay. processed animal meat. There it's we go. It's that not great, is it? Better that no, but it just is what it is. Um, See, I always thought it was specially prepared American meat because that's like you're taking away the negative connotations with processed there, and you've got prepared. Mm. It sounds like you've been it's been lovingly prepared by the Americans. Yeah, but it hasn't. But it hasn't. No. no. <laughs> It's been processed by him. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. He has. Um, you've even got some people saying that it stands for shoulder of pork and ham. Wow. There you go. Mm. There's a rogue O in there, but anyway. We'll let it slide. We'll let it, we'll let it stand. It should be called spism. Spism. Specially prepared sodium nitrate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you boys have ever been on the Spam website before. Um, Can't say I have. No, it's not a place you'd frequent. They've got a very slick slogan, Spam. And I want you guys to each come up with what you think it is. Um, Spam, Spam, it's spiced ham. That's it. It's like a little jingle. Nice. A jingle. Yeah, short and sweet. Yeah. Give it, give it a bit more character. Go again. <laughs> like you're on the radio. Like, no, I, I think it should be a bit a bit withdrawn like my original one. Like, spam, spam. It sizzles, uh, sizzle, pork, and mmm. No. <laughs> no. Sizzle, <laughs> pork, and mmm. No, come on. You've had your fun yeah. now, Andrew. You've just said you. Sizzle, pork, mmm, and mmm. So when, when kind of spam first hit the shelves, it was the housewife's dream. Quick, easy, and it won't break the bank. Super cheap. The ads yep. were all about versatility as well. Fry it, bake it, slap it between some bread for a spam, which it had it all. <laughs> and kind of an yep. anointed with its new name, the product was really kind of promoted with super heavy advertising um, that really emphasised its whole versatility. For example, in 1940, Hormel, uh, the food company that um, invented spam, fielded submissions from spam fans to create a 20-page recipe book featuring 50 ways of incorporating canned meat into meals. Wow. So it's kind of becoming a bit of a novelty, isn't it? Mm. It's like, what can you do with spam? Exactly. They're trying to... People saying like, oh, what have you done with your spam this week? Like, oh, exactly. I tried this and this was cool. They're trying to integrate it into people's lives, trying to create a community. Normalise it, isn't it? Mm. Spamunity. Oh, there it is. Formal foods. Nice. I'm available. You know, in a, in, a, in a time in America where, you know, the corporate world is is only growing, convenience, food is, is becoming more and more popular, husbands are working late and women are having babies, you know, and everyone's busy. They want something quick that can just, psh, dinner, done. Psh. But obviously, 1940, something's coming on. World War II, yeah, not great, but it was great for spam, actually. Really great. It really put spam on the map and it was on the menu for Uncle Sam's Finest with a whopping seven grams of protein. 16 grams of fat and 180 calories per slice. Per slice. How, how thick are we calling a slice? Miles. Half a brick. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't deal in slices. I deal in bricks. <laughs> I do it in ounces. Man, man's on road slinging spam bricks. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know, as a wartime food, it's perfect, isn't it? You know, mm. you don't need any oil to cook with it. It's got enough fat content in it itself. You can just drop it into a, you know, a cast iron pan on a little fire Mate, that you've built and you just... That very rarely are they able to cook anything in World War They're just not, yeah, well, they're not even cooking it. Yeah, they're no. just scrambling whatever they've got. Yeah, yeah. I mean, each can yeah. packed with six servings. It was ready to fuel the troops. And obviously here's the kind of icing on the cake as well. No expiration dates in spam. What the about- hell? That's got to be... It doesn't off- go off. No, are you sure? It's got a best buy. It's got to be eight. It's got a best buy date, okay. which gives it around a shelf life of around three years, but it doesn't officially have an expiry date or didn't at the time. That's off-putting in a food for me. Technically, you could grab an original can of spam that was made in 1937, open it now, and you should be all right to eat it. You reckon there's like a black market for that? Well, that's what I was like thinking. Like you know, you, you, you've got wine cellars, but pe- exactly, people have got little spam cellars. Yeah, well, we'll get a Patreon up, and then if anyone wants us to eat a 1937 can of spam, um, that'll be an option 
on Patreon. Okay. It'll be 10 grand. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's my wedding anniversary. Boys, come round and we'll crack a 1940. Yeah, uh, like you do with like a bottle of whiskey. Spam. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, can you smell the notes in this one? <laughs> oh, God, yeah, the nuttiness. Still got the goo on it. Oh, Still got the jelly. I miss, oh, the goo. Yes. I miss the goo. Pretty insane foresight, though, if somebody was stocking them, like tucking them away. Mm, like getting in early on Bitcoin, yeah. Yeah. But spam. Yeah. 150 million pounds of spam was used in the war effort. Is that pounds uh, sterling or pounds weight? Pounds weight. We're American, aren't we, at the minute? And needless to say, it, you know, spam became a cornerstone of the troops' diet. Um, fun fact as well, that the soldiers also used spam's grease to lubricate their guns and to waterproof their boots. Wow. Wow. So they're using it to, to kill German soldiers. Yeah. Wow. And so like it's a that. weapon too. It's a weapon too. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how many deaths Spam has been responsible for, yeah. you know. It's a weapon. Exactly. They wouldn't have died because the gun would have jammed, but luckily Spam was there. Shiny boots, food in your belly, and a jerry down. <laughs> All from one can. That should be the fucking slogan. <laughs> there, Get on the website. <laughs> there it is. Uh, As the popular um, Time magazine later noted... Among fed-up fighting men from Atu to Anzio, spam became one of the most celebrated four-letter words in World War II. It gave birth to a flavoursome literature of tales, odes, jokes, and limericks. It's just everywhere. Where, where, wherever there was GIs, there was spam. And it's given them something to talk about, isn't it, from the sound of that quote? You know, when they're on the front lines and they're all eating spam, they're kind of making jokes out of it. Mm. You know, when they're writing in their journals to send or sending letters home, they're maybe talking about spam. It's just becoming like a, a thing they're all... Maybe they were unwanted letters back from the front and that's where spam emails came from. I don't think so. There you go. Maybe. I don't don't think so. No, but maybe. Maybe. It's an interesting theory. Yeah, no, it's an interesting theory. Mm. Could Could be. be. Did they ever uh, catch on with non-American troops? Well, we'll come to that in a moment. Okay. Yeah, I mean, like I said, in, in each country where they were stationed, American soldiers introduced it to the locals giving foreigners kind of their first taste of spam. Um, We'll come back to this point later on because spam is super popular in some of those places still to this day. And it's part of their national like identity in some countries. But sticking with the GIs for now, it wasn't all love. There is such thing as too much of a good thing. With the US sending around 15 million cans of spam per week to troops during the conflict, soldiers quickly began to grow sick of it don't see how that's possible but yeah <laughs> <clears throat> too much sodium nitrate i'd have loved world war Two. <laughs> i think i'd have thrived on the front lines shiny boots spam uh, shiny boots spam in the belly and jetties down <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I can imagine. I mean, any, any, yeah, like you said, anything that's great, too much of it is um, is not a good thing. No, no, if that's all you're eating all the time, you, you're probably screaming for a tender stem broccoli, aren't you? Screaming for it, <laughs> gagging for it. I'm sure that's what they were all writing in their letters back from the yeah. front. Yeah, Dorothy, please send a tender stem or a carrot or maybe some turnips. Anything, let anything, anything. Just send it my anything. way. The uh, the Oxford Encyclopedia of Food and Drink in America describes the angry letters written by soldiers addressed to Hormel, the actual fucking manufacturer of spam, directly to the source. And they also sent them to military newspapers called um, Yank and Stars and Stripes. Like WikiLeaks all over again. <laughs> Yank and Stars and Stripes. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't and roll off the tongue, does it? <laughs> no, it doesn't. As a company, if you're receiving letters from soldiers that are fighting for the freedom of your nation, mm. complaining about your product, yeah, um, you're going to listen to those letters, aren't you? You should, but they got a contract from the government, so they're laughing, so they're all right. Oh, well, yeah, actually, they're not bothered. No, they're not bothered at all. But in the letters themselves, soldiers called the product ham that didn't pass its physical. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. meatloaf without basic training. They're good at these. <laughs> and the real reason yeah. war was hell. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god it's not, the real it's reason not glowing. <laughs> it's not great is it it's not great it's not it's not great from people that you'd imagine would just be really happy to have it exactly as well exactly. yeah i mean if they're not appreciating it then it yeah don't bode well no not at all we um we even have a great quote from none other than general dwight eisenhower when he wrote a letter to retire retired formal executive commenting on his company's famous product 
During World War II, of course, I ate my share of spam along with millions of other soldiers. I'll even confess to a few unkind remarks about it, uttered during the strain of battle. You understand? But as former commander-in-chief, I believe I can still officially forgive you your only sin, sending us so much of it. Cheers, Dwight. That was brilliant. Yeah, it sounded quite kind of like him, actually. During World War II, of course, I ate my fair share of spam along with all the other soldiers. I'll confess there was a few unkind remarks about it, and they were even uttered in the strain of battle. But he's saying, I think you, your only sin, really, was just sending us too much. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's Too much of it. Fair. In a 1945 interview with the New Yorker, Jay Hormel, who was the um, big boss of the company during the time of the war, he described the unexpected reaction from American soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. He he told the magazine that he'd kept a scurrilous, scurrilous? Yeah. file of abusive letters sent to him by troops fighting the war, where he'd been compared to both Hitler and Hirohito. Ooh. <laughs> Yeah, I'm guessing like, because there was so much spam going out there, the government probably felt less of a need to send other stuff. Like yeah. that was taken up, exactly. taking, the, taking the place of other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it was so perfect as well, right? Everything else needed some kind of refrigeration or some kind of... Like packaging. Packaging, or exactly. Mm. You know, uh, you could send a box of crackers, but the box might get wet and water yeah. will get inside the box and all the crackers are fucked. Like if a box of spam gets wet, it's fine. Yeah, exactly just rolls off because of the gelatin so i think you know you it's a pro, you know it's a problem you can have too much of spam yeah i can't but people can people can so you know you can see why they were getting sick of it very quickly no no you're right and it remained like a mainstay of post-war menus in allied countries as well so even after the war ended it was still very much a um a popular food item once you've even got in taste for it yeah no exactly um even in the soviet union where it was dubbed roosevelt sausage Oh, um, sounds a bit well, sexual. <laughs> sounds a bit sexual. It does. Uh, but it became part of like aid packages as well. The US sent like devastated Europe and Russia, you know, places that have been completely fucking mm. bombed and destroyed. They'd send obviously aid packages and and in that in those aid packages would be tins of spam. Didn't send any to Hiroshima, did they? They sent something else there, mate. Yeah, they yeah, got them packages mixed up, didn't they? Sergeant, I sent the wrong thing. <laughs> there ain't no spam on that plane. <laughs> lot, yeah. lot of grease, but no spam. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> That's a dark yeah, joke. Yeah, horrible. Horrendous. Millions died. Horrendous. Yeah, absolutely. Horrendous. Yes. Shout out to his family. <laughs> as, the former Soviet, as the former Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev wrote in his memoir, Khrushchev Remembers, which is a fucking great name for a memoir. <laughs> That's what I'm going to, I'm going to write mine. Cantor, Cantor Remembers. Cantor Remembers. I'll be worried when that comes yeah. out. I'll and just, just call out everybody that fucked me off in my life. <laughs> oh God. I remember yeah. everything. <laughs> but yeah, within his memoir, he had this to say about spam. There are many jokes going around in the army, some of them off color, about uh, American spam. It tastes good, nonetheless. Without spam, we would not have been able to feed our army. We have lost our most fertile lands. Tell down the wall, <laughs> tell down the wall, la la la. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Borat. Oh. Cheers for coming, Borat. That was brilliant. Yeah, that was very Borat. Yeah. Was extremely Borat. Uh, you know, <laughs> did the business. But, you know, the Soviets are also saying that it's what fed their army yeah, too. Yeah, there's a bit of an admission mm. of its, uh, oh, of its yeah. goodness yeah. there, isn't it, really? Because I doubt that they'd yeah. really want to admit anything American was good, but they're happy with no. that. If you think about it, all of their farming industry was completely mm -hmm. fucked. Yeah. Like completely destroyed. Yeah, he says here, we lost our most fertile lands, yeah. so they kind of had to default and they, to spam. And they also lost a lot of people that worked yeah. those lands. Um, mm. So, yeah, they needed something like this to be able to get through and feed the feed the people. Spam saved spam. the world, eh? That's what yeah, I'm getting really, so far. Yeah. Well, it sounds like Russia owes America one. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, like Putin, to have a look at this. Yeah. Putin just reel it in in Ukraine, get, get yeah. the hell out. Mm. Yeah, when you needed help, we were there. So you're saying, Miles, that all we need to do to stop this war 
in Ukraine is to fly tins of spam over. No, no, I'm saying it's more simple than that. Just share that quote with him. Oh. <laughs> just shoot him yeah, a yeah, quick right. WhatsApp. <laughs> Just, yeah, yeah, just right. dusting okay. this little one off. Next week, you're just on yeah. fucking BBC News in this exact frame that you're in now. And you're just talking to <laughs> the man who saved the world. The man who saved the world. Yeah. <laughs> I was on a podcast with my friends um, and I just had this idea uh, just to just to share this quote we were reading out with Putin himself. <laughs> and um, lo and behold, he actually read it and invited me out there. And uh, I got on really well with him and basically just said, like, give it a rest, mate. I told him to get out of Ukraine. And he did. <laughs> he did. <laughs> So I'm back here now and it's just, it's been yeah, a blur. Been, been a whirlwind yeah. week. <laughs> Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah. yeah. And uh, if you're interested in my podcast, it's called What The Food. Yeah. They've cut you by this point. Yeah. They've, they've cut you. They've cut you off yeah, unlucky. That's unlucky. <laughs> Keep me on or I'll go back and tell him to go. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> didn't, hit the, didn't hit the amount of subscribers that we wanted last week. So um, yeah. the war's back on. <laughs> Until we've got, got a my... thousand listeners, it's going to carry on. Yeah. Um, but no, it's, if only if only it was that easy. Um, if only it was that easy. We'd all, we'd all do that. If only. Back in 2012, some really clever marketing boffins, Rajiv Batra, Aaron Ahuvia, probably a bit butchered that name, and Richard Bagosi cracked the code on why we fall head over heels for certain brands. They discovered it's not just about the stuff we buy. It's about the stories, the experiences, and the memories that come with them. Mm-hmm. Hormel, the brains behind Spam, were onto this long before the academics put it into words. They were well ahead of the curve when it came to this. They knew that just knocking out a f- budget-friendly meat in a can, it just wouldn't cut the mustard. They needed they needed some pizzazz, a, a dollop of humour, a sprinkle of the American dream. Yeah. And so they set Spam up as the poster child of Yankee know-how with just a little hint of quirkiness. Imagine this, right? The war's just ended. Obviously, Spam hasn't really got the best reputation with the GIs, but it's still popular with housewives. Mm -hmm. But who hits the road to sing the praise, praises of Spam? Um, A a Spam band. A band of Spam. They play... You're you're almost. It's the Hormel Girls. A troop of singing, swinging veterans spreading the Spam gospel as far and wide, even landing their own hit radio show. A show, not just a song. They've got like their own show. They've got that Great. their own radio show. So Getting all right out there, aren't they? They really kind of created a community around spam and mm. really tried to like make it more than just the product, make it more of like an like experience, whole, you know, experience. And are these like the harmonizing girl singers? You know, all- exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it's even more. Fast forward a few years, and you've got Spamarama, which is a legitimate festival. Where Spam's the star of the show, Spamarama. Wow. It is right. a long time annual festival and it's a competitive cook off. It's held in Austin, Texas. The first one was in 1978 and yeah, it includes a spam cook off, spam themed competitive activities, mm-hmm. maybe a tug of war, perhaps, on a, on a long log of spam. <laughs> That's disgraceful. <laughs> or maybe, Miles, nice. maybe they've made a rope. Of spam. Ooh, spam rope. Oh, spam rope. My life's wet you, dream. Then you've got me. <laughs> to your favorite then thing. you've wow. got me. I'd love this, to attend this festival. Yeah, it took a war. Mm, It'd be right. solid if it still had the gelatine uh, recipe yeah, going. Yeah, you all slippy. Slippery well little slippy sausage. Oh, That'll be a good little clip noise. for the socials. <laughs> 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 just that little two seconds. No, no lead in, just <laughs> <laughs> no context. <laughs> uh, yeah whole festival of just spam yeah i, I want to read you the little bit of the wikipedia entry from the spam olympics which is the competitive part of the spamarama I thought, festival I thought it was an extra bit as well that was no no no, 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 no. It's, no so it's all in, you know under the umbrella of the spamarama event okay. you know you, you pay you, you pay your ticket and you get <laughs> you get the lot four or five events yeah it's great wow so the core spam olympic event is the spam toss and the spam eating competition okay spam eating contest isn't called Spam eating contest, of course. It's called the Spam Cram because you. That's a good one. They've the done a good, cram. good job there. Well done, them. Um, the first person to finish eating the contents of an entire twelve ounce can of spam wins. So that's the Spam Cram, mm. and then you've also got the Spam Toss, where two person teams toss spam from a twelve ounce can to the, each other. The team that throws it the farthest without dropping it wins the Spam Toss. Wow, I feel like there's a lot of spam getting wasted at this festival. Yeah, <laughs> you fuming about it? <laughs> a lot of dropped spam. It we seems a bit one, wrong. We only got one planet. Respect the spam. Yeah. Uh, 
respect the spam. I mean, you're going to hate this, Miles, really. Other events have been included at various Spam Olympics. The Spam Carving Display, where you have to... Knew, how, how did I know that was going <laughs> you have to carve. I knew it was. It's like a blank canvas, to be fair. Yeah. And yeah but what's everyone doing with those little bits you cut off? Leave just little tasty morsels. Compress it back into a new one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just goes back to the factory and just gets squished into a new block. Like MDF. You should keep going. MDF, yeah, exactly. <laughs> MDF with the meat world. But no, people often carve out themes based on current events, body parts or animals, such as the Spam Gator, which is a very famous one. Are they only allowed to use one block or can they like combine lots of blocks to make like a full-sized alligator? Yeah, I think, I think the world's, the world's your spam can. You can go out however <laughs> many you want. Fucking great work there, sir. Well done, you. Fun. Well Thank done, you. Very much. There's a few other uh, events that doesn't really give too much context on Wikipedia, so maybe we'll do a bit yeah. more research and maybe post those on social, but there's one called the Spam Calling Contest. I'm not really sure what that is. The Spam Facial. Oh, no. Think of it, that sodium nitrate is drying your skin out. Mm. Sucking any moisture yeah. that you had. And probably the best yeah. of the lot, the tug of war across a pit filled with spam. <laughs> that is such a waste. <laughs> <laughs> a whole pit <laughs> of spam. A bit of spam. Oh, it's an outrage. <laughs> what on earth? Uh. <laughs> you just find me in the pit swimming about having bites. <laughs> Wherever you can, little piranha. <laughs> Uh, where's Miles? Someone's in the spam pit. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's it's evidently part of everyday life if they're having all these bloody festivals and parties and parades. Yeah, Love of course. it. Of course. Centred around yeah. spam. You've got a museum dedicated to all things spam. You've got a spam NASCAR, um, a Broadway hit called Spam A Lot, a musical folks singing about can meet. Super popular. It, um, it was in a uh, Monty Python sketch. It was. It was. It's, I've it's, heard about yeah. it. Very, Very famous, pop, sketch, popular yeah. pop culture moment for the old mm. spammy. Mm. It was, it was. But it's what we were saying before. It's like, it's become synonymous with canned meat. Like you say canned meat, there's probably thousands and thousands of canned meat products out there. Mm. We can't think of one single brand name no. of any other. It's just, you think of canned meat and you just go to spam, don't you? Yeah, no, exactly. They've just, they've, just, they've just taken that that spot. That spot. Yeah. No, for sure. For sure. Oh my God. I was onto something earlier, boys. I'm just reading here. Spam emails is named after spam because of that Monty Python sketch. Oh, well, because everything in the cafe is like named after spam. Well, yeah. Everything so uh, it's, uh, yeah, I guess it's it's joking about those post-war years where spam was in everything because mm. it says the meaning of the word spam came to describe pesky unwanted emails through a Monty Python sketch that first hit the television screens in 1970. The sketch. Mm. Whoa. Dangling wires over two hapless customers into a diner. They hear about the available dishes, but every single menu item has spam in it. Yep. Egg and spam. Egg, bacon and spam. Spam, egg, sausage and spam. Yeah. Spam, egg, spam. So they just spam, can't bacon, get past spam. spam. It's just like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I thought that spam emails were just like short for something else. Yeah, that acronym was yeah. Yep. But there you go. Whoa. And that's like such everyday language now, isn't it? In this digital world yeah, that we live in. Yeah. Spam. Yeah, it says spam here, email. you see, after World War II, spam was abundant in both the UK and the US. As Britain struggled mm-hmm. to rebuild its agricultural infrastructure, people were tired of spam. It was, after all, everywhere. There you have there it. You go. Wow. Right. What's that marketing thing called where it's like you, you you want your product to be the name, like the verb of doing something? Synonymous. Like in the same way that we'd say like, oh, well, yeah, no, it's not synonymous. There's another word, but it's like, I'll quite easily say, oh, I need to hoover the flat mm-hmm. this weekend. Or I need to well, Google it. Hoover is just a brand name. It's actually, I'm actually mm-hmm. vacuuming. Mm. But Hoover is just a brand name of a vacuum and it's become like yeah. so synonymous with Velcro, with that. another good yeah. example. Like Google it. Yeah. Google it instead of saying, um, I need to use a search engine to find out that answer. Mm. But it, but then spam is being used negatively. Like no one wants spam emails. True. Mm. But you know. But uh, it's not really negatively impacting the nah, brand. Yeah, spam, it's, though, it's it? further enough away that it doesn't really impact them. But also it's yeah. like uh, yeah. any uh, coverage is good coverage, right? Yeah. Solidified their name in history. Yeah. And just when you thought spam couldn't surprise you anymore, they start playing with the, with the recipe, don't they? What the hell? Fancy a spam burger? Yeah, I could do that. Maybe spam lights, more your speed, half the fat. Maybe they turn up the heat, spam hot and spicy. Whoa. Roll home the bacon with spam and bacon. Maybe spam spam teriyaki or maybe spam jalapeno. And, f- and for those who prefer spreading to slicing, there's even spam spread. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> nah, it oh might sound. I was I was on board with all those yeah, until you got some, to that. Can't caramelize that, can you? There's some right flavors here. No. Spam with Portuguese sausage seasoning. Yeah, they've really they've they've you know they've really done something to it. They've really done something to it. No, stick with what you do normally. Don't Spam be trying to mess pumpkin about. Pumpkin spice edition, 2019. Oh no! If this wasn't on the official Spam website, I wouldn't believe it. Spam figgy pudding, 2022. What? Doesn't tell you anything more about it. It just says that. But Spam figgy pudding. What fit like figs? Yeah, figs. it looks. It's got like little mistletoe on top. I'm gonna have to dig deeper into that. Christ, we'll order. Oh, we'll order some God. of these tins and we'll we'll try a few. Yeah, they, <laughs> last year they launched yeah. spam maple flavored introduced. I could get behind that because yeah. like you have maple bacon. Yeah, don't you? no, like yeah, yeah. Well, let's order some in and do like a an Instagram live. <laughs> and eat along. Eat okay. along. We'll do that. <laughs> yeah. Wow. As a whole, I think it's a masterclass, really, in making a brand. Not just something you buy, but something you buy into. You know, it turns Spam into a slice of America, I think. Like a kind of fun and a dash of daring. But yeah, I've, as we've kind of already established, Spam needs war. Lives off it. <laughs> thrives <laughs> off it. Okay. I think I know where you're going with this, actually. To start with, I was like, Christ, you're demonizing the brand, but I know where you're going. Nah, it needs it. Lives off yeah. it. The good news for Spam is that we've got a few more for it to indulge in. Most notably, the Vietnam War, the Korean War, and then also the Cold War conflicts. As troops set up camp towns and military bases, they interacted with locals. Like during the Korean War, American troops traded military goods like Coca-Cola, gum, corned beef, and Spam for sex services and entertainment. I ain't giving up my Spam for a blowy. <laughs> I'd, rather t- I'd rather take the Spam. <laughs> You get your blowy from your spam, can't you? You can get like a, that's not what I meant. Like an, no. like an old school flashlight. Oh, <laughs> specially prepared American <laughs> masturbation. That is foul. Uh, oh, it's bad. Uh, oh, it's too no, good. I wasn't. I, did, I good. didn't mean that. No, I just meant that I'd rather that than the blowjob. Not that I was going to use that in place mm. of the blowjob. Right, right. I'm still going to eat the spam. Okay. It's just I'd rather the spam. Um. So what? So what's happening here? So they're kind of like trading with these other people and kind of slowly introducing spam to these other cultures exactly. through this kind of trading. Good old bit of bartering. Okay. Um, in other places like the Philippines, the GIs threw cans of spam to hungry kind of locals um, whose like lives had been kind of turned upside down by the war. And spam kind of really rooted itself in Filipino culture to the point where the Philippines to this day still has an all spam restaurant. Um, wow. And the menu at Spam Jam boasts a spam burger, spam spaghetti, spam baked macaroni and spam Caesar salad. Wow. I mean, I'm not going to knock them until I've tried it. <laughs> no, you're right. You'll try anything once. Aren't you? Licking your lips. <laughs> <laughs> I did manage to find a story about someone's grandmother who grew up near war zones in Korea. When she was young, locals in her town would steal scraps of food from the military bases that were there. Mm-hmm. And once her friend offered her a boudet jjigae, I think it's called. Again, it's Korean. <laughs> Don't speak Korean. But um, And as she was biting into it and... and We'll get into what it is in a moment. Um, She found a GI's discarded cigarette floating amongst the chunks of spam in the soup. Oh, God. What's this GI term? Um, I know you're using it like for soldiers, but what does GI mean? Good question. It means it's an informal term that refers to a soldier in the United States Armed Forces. Oh, okay. Um, GI. GI, yeah. General inscription or something. I'm not actually sure what it stands for. Because you've got G.I. Joe, haven't that you? Is one. You've got G.I. Joe. Well, that. Yeah, I think it is enlisted men, yeah. Earliest known record mm. of G.I. being used to refer to an American enlisted man, a slang term off from 1935. Originally, G.I. Okay. stood for galvanised iron, primary material used to make ma- military items. Mm. However, issue. yeah, as the military grew and evolved over time, it took on multiple meanings, including government issue, general issue, or even ground infantry. Yeah, or even general infantry as well. But just back to that uh, Korean dish that I was on about that, Buddha Jjigae. Mm. It was developed during the Korean War um, and it incorporated spam 
American cheese, franks, beans, noodles, vegetables, rice cakes, and other Korean staples. It translates, roughly translates to military stew. And it was just a case of Mm. putting everything they could possibly salvage or scavenge from the military camps into a big old stew. Whoa. Yeah, it's also known as Johnson Johnson stew as well, because it was named for President Lyndon B. Johnson, who apparently couldn't get enough of it. Wow. um, During his visit to South Korea. Wow. So it started out as something they were just salvaging from these war camps yeah. and then just kind of became a staple dish. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. It's like a gumbo in a way, isn't like it? Like a gumbo, like, yeah. Yeah. Just whatever they've got yeah. lying around, stick it in there. When the wars ended though, the American military left behind cans and cans of spam. Like you're not going to take it with you back back home. And it doesn't go out of date as we know earlier. So they could have been sitting around there for years. Wouldn't found. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Janisa Kinsha, the senior brand manager of spam, at Hormel Foods, says. You start to see countries like South Korea, the Philippines, and Japan really starting to utilize it in their own ways. It was actually these communities that started elevating this brand and making it their own. Well, interesting name, so that. she's saying they're kind of... Janisa. Janisa Kishn- Kinsha. Janisha. Mm. Kinsha. Yeah. So she's saying these other countries like South Korea and the Philippines and Japan started to utilize it in their own ways. So yeah, they've kind of started adopting it into their cuisine, haven't they? Mm. Using it in ways they would other kind of products. Mm, They have. I managed to come Mm. across a lady called Maya Koikari. She is a sharp-minded sociologist from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And she delved into kind of this phenomenon in her 2018 essay called Love, Spam, Food, Military and Empire in Post-World War II Okinawa. Wow. Catch your title. uh, Yeah. But she Niche. she um, she unpacked how after the end of World War Two and the Cold War, spam kind of wormed its way into the hearts and kitchens of Okinawa, courtesy of the American GIs. Koikari and kind of a exploration, she discovered that spam didn't just kind of find a spot on the shelf of these local communities; it became a staple in their diet, mm. and it really kind of started to star in dishes from like spam taco rice to spam piccata. Mm. This is an extract from her essay. Awestruck by American military prowess, local populations welcomed luncheon meat and other foreign items that poured into their communities, embracing the American way of life and altering their indigenous food and foodways forever. So I think she's she's mm. seen it as like spam. She, she, her argument is like the locals are seeing spam as this like um, American kind of symbol of influence. Mm. If we if we kind of take this spam and kind of incorporate it into our diets will be as strong as America kind of seems to them because obviously, you know, these military bases and whatever, they're like absolutely yeah. fucking humongous. Big exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Obviously they've got a bit of a complex relationship with kind of the U S military presence. So it's, I think there's like 75% of U S military facilities in Japan are in Okinawa. Okay. So it's quite like a bit complex, but I think that's a super interesting kind of, yeah way that spam wormed itself into into a society mm, yeah the local culture and i bet it was so different to all the other kind of products they had available as well mm. like it was so different i'm guessing when it turned up yeah. that it was like a bit of a welcome surprise they didn't have this kind of product available so you know they're gonna they're gonna run away with it and kind of have fun experimenting mm. with it mm-hmm. no for sure and it's like a cornerstone of the local cuisine now it's like a source of pride and like their kind of whole uh, what they've done with spam kind of changes our kind of whole notion of what is authentic because they've kind of taken something mm. that was no, not in any way culturally relevant or, yeah. or culturally local to them and just kind of evolved it and kind of shaped, yeah. shaped it to something that works and is synonymous with their culture. Yeah. Well, there's kind of like a modern day version of that with um, Japan and KFC, isn't there? Mm. Because they have KFC on Christmas Day now, don't they? Do, they? Yeah. yeah. And it's kind of become culturally acceptable to have your Christmas day mm. bargain bucket or whatever. So I don't know, there must be this notion in um, in Japan of kind of taking American or Western things and kind of enjoying the novelty of them a bit. Yeah. I don't know. It's interesting. It's a strange one. I, I think enjoying the novelty, but also making it their own, I think is what they do really well. Like improve upon mm. something that's, that already exists. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Which is kind of the Japanese way, isn't it? I'm trying to think of an example now I've said that, but I'm <laughs> fairly certain, I'm fairly certain throughout history they've, uh, they've taken things that- Whiskey. They didn't initially design, but improve upon it. Yeah, whiskey. Trains. Wasn't it like, I was going to say mechanical things, mm. like they were kind of introduced to like a lot of uh, engineering and mechanical stuff. Yeah by the West, I think. Mm-hmm. And 
then just kind of took it and ran with it and improved a lot of that shit. Yeah. Another spot where Spam kind of put down solid roots is Hawaii. Okay. So obviously island paradise. But in this island paradise, a staggering 7 million cans of Spam find their way into the hearts and homes each year. It's it's everywhere from the beloved Spam Musubi, which is a delightful kind of concoction of um, Spam, rice and seaweed. Have you guys heard of that before? I say I have. Is it this? Is it the kind of like flat rice with the piece of spam on it wrapped in the seaweed with, in the middle? Around? Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, that's like a sushi chocolate bar. Sushi chocolate bar. So okay, I get the sushi bit with the rice. Yeah, chocolate bit. So it's no chocolate in it, but just like you know, little little treat. <laughs> I don't know where you go with this one, Milo. <laughs> But I don't know. I just feel like if there's one place on planet Earth that doesn't really need the influence mm. of canned pressed meat, it's, it's Hawaii. Hawaii. Yeah, but they've not got much agricultural means, have they? They can't really, they've got much real estate to be raising cows or pigs or things like that. So yeah, I know everything you're saying is true. I get it. <laughs> Geography and that. But I don't know. I just want to go to Hawaii and eat fresh stuff. You know, I want yeah. to eat fish from the what? sea. I yeah. want to eat stuff, nice stuff. Fresh. But anyway. Well, yeah, I mean, you don't have to eat spam. <laughs> <laughs> They're not forcing you when you turn up. <laughs> they don't like put them fucking veil of flowers around your neck and shove little, a bit of spam in you. little layer around your neck. And, <laughs> Come on, have your spam fritter. You're not coming across passport <laughs> control until you've had it down you. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, it's safe to say it's it's loved out there, especially Masubu, um, but also in breakfast menus of local McDonald's, you will find uh, spam platters. And the spam is like the main kind of meat that they serve within their breakfast platters. So it's so McDonald's have kind of officially partnered with spam. Yeah, uh, but only there oh. because it's so ingrained in that society. Bad that. Yeah, I did manage to come across a interesting story of a bloke called Seiju Ifuku, whose life story kind of weaves together legacies of Okinawa, Hawaii, and spam into a kind of really kind of cool little, little story. So Ifuku is a proud veteran of the hundredth battalion a distinguished American World War II unit composed of Nisi soldiers. And they obviously brought with them the flavours of Spam from the battlefields back to the beaches of Hawaii when the war ended. After his service in 1961, Ifuku and his wife opened the doors to Rainbow Drive-In, which is in Honolulu, and they began to offer a taste of comfort and nostalgia with their hearty, affordable meals. Now, Mm. Rainbow Drive-In isn't just an eatery. It's a place that's kind of, well, it's stooped steeped in history and it's endorsed by none other than former president Barack Obama. Wow. This is go-to spot it. for a classic Hawaiian plate lunch, which star of the show. Wow. Spam. Of course it is. Still standing in its original location, the drive-in under the stewardship of Ifuku's grandson, Chris Iwamuru, continues to dish out over a thousand plate lunches daily, sticking faithfully to the original wow. recipes that have delighted generations before. Wow. Yeah. I respect that. Respect. He's not switching up too much. No. He might be modernising bits of it, but he's keeping all the OG recipes yeah. as is. Among the menu's highlights are the spam and two eggs plate and the simple, yeah, satisfying spam sandwich, which features mm. a generous, generous smells. And Dom, mm. Dom, maybe. I'm not sure if you'd be into it, but a generous slab of spam. Yeah, I'm not a spam. I'm tucked between fresh lettuce and tomato on white bread. We, I did manage to find a lovely quote from... Uh, Chris Iwamuru, the um, the guy that's running the restaurant now, the grandson, and he has this to say about Spam. Spam is a comfort food. We grew up eating it. It's tied to memories of childhood, of soccer games and tennis matches, where Spam Masubi was a treat waiting for us. It's about nostalgia, the comforting feeling that takes you back. Hmm. Hmm. It's got like a place in their heart, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think so. Spam. It's more in Hawaii. It's more than just a food. It's like a reminder of home, community, and kind of the simple, the simple joys that that flavour mm. pairs with cherished memories. Whereas back in mainland America, the veterans gives them PTSD. It's not nice memories. It gives them horrendous nightmares, shivering, fever pitch. Back in the trenches. Nightmares. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it takes them right back. So, you know, it's nice that on one hand uh, in Hawaii, it's, uh, you know, it's reminding these kids of uh, soccer games and tennis matches, but it's not like that for everyone. All right. All right. Fast forward to today and you can say that we are witnessing nothing less than a grand spam renaissance. A spectacular arrival that's catapulting this once humble canned meat into the stratosphere of modern gastronomy. <laughs> yeah, so it's evolving. It's coming back. Spectacular revival of Spam. It's as if Spam has donned a tuxedo, sipped a martini, and sauntered into the 21st century with a wink and a nod. In an age where retro is the new chic, 
Spam has emerged as the unlikely hero of the culinary underdog story, popping up in the trendiest of eateries where chefs with twirly moustaches and artisanal tattoos are giving it a makeover that would make Cinderella's fairy godmother green with envy. Just two weeks ago, Hormel Foods introduced a spicy variation to its traditional Spam fritter with the debut of Spam Southern Fried Fritters. Chelsea Barnes, a commercial sales manager at Hormel Foods Corporation, commented... This is a parent of two American classics that will offer UK Spam fans a unique twist on their favorite fritter. The Southern Fry seasoning complements Spam perfectly and makes a quick and easy meal served with accompaniments such as potato wedges and corn on the cob. <laughs> that was beautiful. So good. I always find it hilarious, oh. these types of articles. It's someone's job to go out there and say like, these new frozen meat rectangles are really good. Go and buy them. Like, yeah, yeah. Spencil, just baffling to me. And offering us like the sides to go with them, you know. Exactly. Pairings. Like with a wine. Yeah. A bit of cheese. She's saying put it with potato wedges and a corn on the cob. Yeah. I mean, that's a sad dinner, that, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, I just look down at your plate. You've got two little bits of spam. Fritters, though. They're like fried, breaded. You know, but very but very beige. Yeah. Very beige. Mm-hmm. Potato wedges. Beige. Very beige. Yeah. And then yellow corn on the cob. Mm, somewhat beige. You know, somewhat beige. Yeah. The only slightly nutritional thing on the plate. Mm. It's not a it's not a appetizing looking plate of food that. It's not. But um yeah, I mean gone are the days of just simple spam in the can. You know, you've got spam sushi rolls now, spam infused mac and cheese that they're selling, spam cocktails that I've seen on various menus. It's getting wild out there. What does what does that entail? How do you what is that? I'll leave it to your imagination. You know, you've got those slushy machines that are like constantly chilling. Oh, yeah. God. Just got one of them on there with like mint spam in it. Oh. Like uh, you go into like a supermarket and they've got like a pressure own orange juice, but it, instead <laughs> yeah. of oranges in there, it's just cans of spam. You it just press it and it goes, rinse it out. <laughs> <laughs> just, oh, uh, just leave with a little vessel of spam juice ready wow. to go. Surely not. Oh, you know how you've got espresso martini? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Spam martini. It's got like a nice little greasy foam on the top and then a little cube, <laughs> a little cube of spam Perfectly on caramelised on the garnish. Side, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nah. Oh, Jesus. But in this era of Instagram and TikTok as well, spam has found itself an unlikely social media darling. From the hashtag spam can art to viral cooking challenges, the pink meat is enjoying its moment in the spotlight, proving that it's not just photogenic, but also meme worthy. Get yourself some fucking spam can art going. Do it on the weekend. What does that mean? But like they're just drawing shit on the different cans of spam that you get. Cans. Yeah. Yeah. Right, who was doing that, honestly? <laughs> honestly. Spam lovers. <laughs> honestly. <laughs> honestly. Do that. It's also... They're cleverly trying to rebrand Spam a little bit as well as like an eco-conscious choice. How are they managing that? You know, that? with like, obviously, right. well, like obviously with food waste and sustainability on kind of everyone's lips, Spam's long shelf life is like, you know, a minimal waste as well. There's no, you eat the whole can, right? Mm. You don't waste any of it. And the fact that it lasts forever. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's in vogue. Yeah. It's in vogue, boys. It's in vogue. Comes in an aluminium can, so that can be recycled. Exactly. It's not coming in plastic. It's a... Uh, yeah, I think aluminium's like the least. Yeah, very easy uh, to you know, easy taxing to material. Mm-hmm. You're right. On the, uh, yeah, on the planet. So I think it's safe to say that we yeah. stand in the midst of a spam renaissance. Mm. Um, mm. It's transcended its humble beginnings to becoming a symbol of nostalgia, innovation, and culinary cheekiness. Ooh, <laughs> cheeky! <laughs> what time struggle? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's it. That's the story of spam. What a story it was. Very interesting. History from something so seemingly yeah, unassuming, boring, and unassuming. Yeah, yeah exactly. I never thought to. Yeah, I have just got three spam facts I want to end on. Found very interesting. So spam is available in forty-one countries at the moment. Forty-four thousand cans of spam are produced every hour. Which forty-four thousand every hour thousand cans every hour, which equates to around what? thirty-three thousand pounds of spam every hour. Oh my god! On average, of course. What? Oh, that's mad. Wow. <laughs> such a scale. Yeah, such 11, a scale. <laughs> 12 a second. Do they know the war ended? <laughs> they know? There's no Germans <laughs> like, left to fight. <laughs> yeah. Spam cooks its meat 
after it is packaged inside of the tin. Shut it's up. It's like it's in little Shut oven. Shut up. No. Exactly. They like boil it or something or... It's cooked inside. Yeah, I think, I, I'm not sure if they... Maybe they boil it or they, they add heat yeah. to it in some way that the can doesn't melt or misshape or yeah. something like that. Yeah, it's cooked it's inside. It's getting like wow. steamed in there. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that is mad. Yeah. There you go. According to the folks at Hormel, this is the final fact for all that you... Spam lovers go. The company that makes spam, obviously Hormel, we spoke about them quite a bit. 12.8 cans of spam are eaten in the world every second. So they're only just about at replacement rate, really, after my quick math. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then it, on top of that, you've got stockpilists and end of the world people, remember, that are fucking buying it in bulk. Ah, uh, yeah. Spamming themselves with cans of spam, if you will. <laughs> Spamming with spam. Spamming with spam. It's interesting, it's 12.8. Some some fuckers not finishing their can. <laughs> Miles is Miles, you'd be straight onto them, wouldn't you? <laughs> He's seething. Yeah. Get that percentage up. <laughs> it's all those people at that festival with the trimmings and then trying to yeah. shape it and sculpt it. And the pool of it. Oh, you're right. So you have it. Spam facts. You'd have thought of it. Yeah. The history of spam. Yeah. The history if of spam. They've just yeah. sold the eight billionth can. That means that they basically got one can for every human that's alive on Earth at the moment. Wow. Spam. That's a lot. Wild. That is crazy. It's taking the world yeah. by storm. It was quite nice to do um, a food item that's got quite recent history. Mm. You know, like mm. with it being introduced first in the 1900s. It made made my job a lot easier. Like in terms of actually researching it and finding articles that you can trust. Mm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That have kind of written in a language that you can read. Yeah, and yeah exactly. <laughs> easily accessible. Exactly right. Well, there you go. Spam. That took us uh, to some interesting places for sure. All over the shop. One thing we can take away from that is that mm. the world loves spam. It does. And spam loves the world. Not pigs. Pigs don't love spam. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that episode as much as we did chatting about it. And thank you for being with us. It's good to have you. Um, if you want to send us an email and get in touch, you can do that at whatthefoodpodcast at gmail.com. Say hello or we'll recommend a dish or a food item or a drink that you want us to cover and we can do that and give you a shout out. And then, yeah, if you're enjoying the podcast, please share it with a friend. That'd be really helpful. And give us a rating wherever you listen to the podcast. You can kind of uh, give us, you can give ratings now on Spotify and on Apple Podcasts and, and all the other places. And that really helps us show up on, on people's feeds, which is which is ace. So cool. We'll, we'll love you and leave you. We'll see you in two weeks time for the next episode. See you then. Bye. Bye.